So there are two questions I'm interested in you answering at the end of this video. Firstly, do you think what I'm going to talk about is a cause for concern? And secondly, if this is going to impact our freedom to photograph people, could that actually be the right decision? Let me start at the beginning. Not too long ago, I got some hate messages, as all YouTubers do. Most of the time, I'll just ignore them, delete them, block them, but occasionally I'll reply because everyone just wants a voice. Sometimes people don't expect me to actually see their message, and sometimes they're a bit taken aback when I respond. They suddenly realise that they're hurling abuse at an actual human being, and they backtrack a little. Sometimes I can turn initially hostile messages into a pleasant conversation. But this person just got more and more wound up the more I tried to engage them in chat. They were getting angrier and angrier at the fact I had a sponsored integration in my video, and the more I gently tried to explain that being paid for doing work is actually quite normal, the more unreasonable they became. And after a while, I just gave up and I deleted their comments, only to later be greeted with a load of rewritten angry comments from the same commenter, because this person was really on a mission. But the thing is that this commenter had used their real name and photo. So I decided to look them up and I'm not interested in doxing anyone or revenge, but it's often good to get some perspective to try to understand other people because we're all human and the internet does weird things to our brains and it makes us act in ways we probably wouldn't do in person. And it's also helpful for my own mental health because when someone's criticized something I've done, it's good to see that their own attempts to do anything similar really aren't worth my concern. But the more I looked into this person, the more I started to get concerned about simply how much I could find out about them. I found out where they lived. I found out their personal phone number. I found their Twitter account. And from that, I could piece together a rough outline of what they'd done in their lives, the different places they'd lived, who they knew, where they went to college. I found their LinkedIn. I found their Instagram. The amount of information available to me was scary. And quite frankly, I was worried for them because to attack someone in the way they attacked me showed that their own mental health might have been suffering a bit and having personal information like that get into the wrong hands could be dangerous. Someone could do a fair bit of damage. Because while I get people who really hate me or the me that I present on my channel, I also have some very loyal followers and somebody out there potentially could get defensive of me. But whether you use your real name or not is something you can control. But there's another phenomenon that's rapidly developing and it's much more out of our hands. And it's to do with photography. Having made videos where I take photographs of strangers in the street, I get asked a lot about GDPR laws and how they affect photography. So the way I understand it is roughly this. The image of your face is public property whenever you're out. You can photograph people unless they have a reasonable expectation of privacy. It's obviously a lot more complicated than that, but that's the basic essence of the law around this subject, in the UK at least. And I'm not qualified to dispense legal advice, so please contact a qualified legal expert for proper information on this. But as I understand it, street photography and street portraits of strangers are currently fine as long as I don't post their name and contact details with the image. Sean Tucker did a great video on this called Law and Ethics in Street Photography, in which he interviewed Nick Dunmer, the business and legal advisor for the Association of Photographers. In that video, the topic is explored in more depth, and I'll put a link to that video in the description below. Go watch it, it's really good. So, an anonymous face in the street is just that, anonymous. But the world is changing, technology is changing. And in 2017, an image search engine called Clearview AI was created. Clearview sweeps the internet for images of faces, collecting a complex set of biometric data. Now, this process is known as scraping. It then enables the user to utilize this biometric data to match faces within images that have been posted online, whether those faces are the primary subject of the photo or just in the background of someone else's photo. But where it gets interesting for me is the key difference between image recognition software and facial recognition software because it changes the search criteria from someone's image to someone's face. And that means that the emphasis has shifted from the author of the image, the photographer, to the owner of the face, the subject. And facial recognition technology has already been fraught with controversy. 
The purpose of Clearview, according to its CEO, was to help law enforcement agencies identify and catch criminals. And while this sounds fine as a concept, there have been reports of its functionality being abused within law enforcement. But facial recognition technology isn't just limited to law enforcement. There are several other instances of much more publicly available facial recognition software, such as the website PimEyes.com. PimEyes Manifesto claims that its purpose is to help people regain control of their own image. It states it exists to counteract identity theft, stalking and revenge porn. This may change, but at the time of making this video, you can go to PimEyes.com right now and perform a free search to see if any photographs of you have been posted online without your knowledge. Now you'll need to sign up for an account and pay a fee in order to find the details of those websites that are displaying the images. So I signed up, just to see how sophisticated this technology actually is. Okay, so I've got the PimEyes website here, and I'm going to test this technology's abilities with these four photos of me. I've got this image of me, and this one of me wearing glasses, this out of focus photo of me, and then this one of me back in the 1990s as a teenager. So let's try the first one. And this seems to have been able to bring up lots of images of me. I can click on any of these to be taken to the website. This one is Photography Daily, that was a podcast I was on. I don't know what this one is. Smoke weed every day. That's not a quote from me. This seems to be a website that's illegally hosting my videos. So PimEyes.com is doing its job and alerting me to sites that are displaying my face without my knowledge. So let's try this next image and see if it brings up any different results. This one seems to be doing a bit better. These ones down here are low score results, which the site thinks could be me, but with a lower accuracy threshold. Most of these aren't me, but a few are. And again, I can click any of these and be taken to the site. Petapixel there with some videos of mine they featured. So let's increase the challenge and give it a blurred image. And it seems to have done it without any problem. It's even found a random article I wrote on a website about parenting. Although this one isn't me. Let's see what this is. The most wanted criminals in Romania. He does look a bit like me. I guess I should steer clear of Romania for a while. So now for the big test. Me when I was about 15. But no, it still seems to know it's me for the most part. I can only speculate as to the true intentions of the website's creators. And while their intentions may well be good, the problem here is that it doesn't really matter what their intentions are. It matters how people could use the technology. Because while it can empower people to regain control of where their image is displayed, it could equally be used for malicious purposes, enabling the very things it claims to protect against. The GDPR laws don't currently affect street photography because an anonymous person walking down the street is still anonymous in a photo of them. But with access to facial recognition software, the person once committed to photographic image is no longer anonymous. So could this change the way we view and share photography? There are whole genres that rely on the subjects within photos to remain candid, unaware of the camera. If we can now find out who these people are, what does that mean for society? Richard Sandler's 1983 shot of West 32nd Street, New York, shows us a black destitute man begging on the street while an affluent white family walk past him. The children stare with innocent fascination while the father grips their hand tightly and glances behind him to check on his wife. The wife turns her shoulders away from the homeless man. She shields her baby as she glances sideways at him disdainfully, nervous as to what he might do. At least that's what it looks like. We don't actually know what the reality of this situation is. This is a socio-political statement about poverty and inequality and racism in urban 1980s America. The figures in this image are mere representations of a wider subject being displayed. The realities of their individual situations and motivations are unimportant. This photo is not about these people, it's about a narrative. And there are many examples of photos like this. One of the greatest aspects of street photography is its ability to show us our own culture from the outside looking in. 
It can hold up a mirror to our lives and make us see ourselves and the culture that we normalise in a more objective way. It can be political, provocative, upsetting, anger-inducing. And what happens then if these candid subjects in these shots become identifiable? If abstract concepts become personified? And this is just one example. Even just the mass exposure of a portrait could potentially become harmful if we're able to identify the person in it. So all this leads me to wonder how our ever-increasing access to facial recognition technology could impact the way that we make and share photographic work. Even if this doesn't change GDPR laws, do we still have a moral obligation to adjust our practices? And if so, how should we adapt? People's right to anonymity is important, but so is art and media, because anonymity can keep people safe. But art and media is our window to the world. It's one of the major influences in pushing our culture forward. So what do you think? Because I'm interested to hear opinions on this.